Hey, good morning, Mr. H hanging out here with you on Friday the 13th. Why do people think Friday the 13th is a bad day? Because uh, it happened, the Last Supper was on a Friday. Uh, Jesus invited 12 people, and number 13 was Judas, and we all know what happened there. Plus, uh, I think Judas uh, skipped out, you know, excuse up to the restroom when he saw the bill approaching. So that's just my theory. But hey, don't need to worry about it. You're safe because you're with me, Mr. H. <laughs> Actually, you may be more danger than you thought. But hey, welcome to Planet Earth. And I hope you guys have a fantastic Friday and a fantastic week and fantastic uh, existence. So, hey, I'm thinking about this, uh, one of America's forgotten wars, man, the Dakota War of 1862. Most people don't know a lot about this because, you know, there was something else happening in 1862. We had that Civil War thing going on. So this thing happened on August the 18th, 1862. What else is going on? Yeah, yeah, the Union were losing pretty bad over there at a second bull run. So this one kind of slipped under the radar. And the whole thing started because, uh, well, you know, the U.S. government is not too good with treaty obligations. So back in the 1850s, they, uh, Little Crow was the uh, chief of the Santee Sioux. They called everybody the Dakota, but they actually call themselves the Sioux, living here western Minnesota, eastern North and South Dakota. And they were they, they gave up land for reservation up here. And, uh, you know, it was a small reservation, 20, 20 miles across, supposed to get money and... Uh, money and uh, supplies and money and supplies were kind of tight because first of all it's the civil war and second of all the bureau of indian affairs was notoriously corrupt so as you can tell they tried to solve problems as far back as 1851 there's little crow right there of the santee sioux and like most trips to washington nothing ever changes nothing ever works the two treaties they had signed over there treaty traverse the sioux and a treaty of mendota uh, again, the land for money, supplies, you know, all this kind of stuff. And um, it never works out because they put these reservations in a place where there's no resources or it's really small. You're not supposed to leave the reservation, but if you're a nomadic hunter and you're chasing buffalo, you know, buffalo don't recognize the lines, so you're going to chase them. Plus, you know, settlers come onto the reservation you're not supposed to, so we have all sorts of problems. 1851 tree was supposed to solve all that. It didn't. And look who they send for the Lower Sioux Agency. Andrew Jackson Myrick, a guy named Andrew Jackson is gonna be in charge of handing supplies out to Native Americans, okay? Everybody knows this is not a guy you wanna send there. Plus from what we've read, he's a bit of an a-hole. So, uh, you know, nobody liked him. He didn't particularly seem like Native Americans. They were, uh, there was a drought in 1861. So a lot of farming and supplies and food weren't going through that Civil War thing. And in 1862, they're, they're asking for the supplies as guaranteed by treaty. It didn't show up. He said, you can go eat grass for all I care. And we don't really know if he actually said that, but yeah, he seems like the kind of guy who would do that. So on the 18th day of August, 1862, they attacked the Lower Sioux Agency. There are other attacks with, uh, with settlers before that in Minnesota. So they run down Andrew Jackson Myrick. As you can guess, they kill him. And they shove grass into his mouth and, uh, shall we say, between his buttocks. All right. So, yep, he didn't come out of this too well. So we've got a war on in the middle of a civil war. The big, um, this is the 19th century version of a meme. Uh, the thing that got all the press are a bunch of battles and skirmishes along the way between the Sioux, various bands of the Sioux, and what they called U.S. volunteers with a, you know, a couple regular army soldiers here there. Uh, there's an attack on a settlement called New Ulm. It's a city now. And this was making all the headlines and everything. Oh, they're going to kill everybody in the town. They didn't take New Ulm, but you know, a lot of people died, mostly settlers. Outside the, um, the small towns, I, I hesitate to say cities. So over 500 settlers would die. Uh, I think 150 U.S. volunteers died in the course of the war. No idea how many Sioux were killed in this thing. But it wasn't very easy. Had to run them down. You see, they're on horseback and they have rifles. So, you know, it's not easy. When it was all over, they sent John Pope. Why would they say John Pope out there? Because he's the guy who lost at, uh, you know, second bull run. So they drop him out there to 
uh, do occupation duty. And as you probably guessed, he's got a bit of a chip on his shoulder after getting his butt handed back to him in northern Virginia. So he ruled with a pretty heavy hand. How heavy a hand? Yeah, 39 Sioux were all hung on December 26, 1862. It would have been 303. They sent the petition to Abraham Lincoln, who had a lot of stuff going on, Civil War stuff, you know. And um, he, uh, there are 303, and he signed off on 39 of them. So they had a mass execution to bring the rebellion there to an end. Little Crow was not one of those guys. He managed to survive the whole thing. He got killed the following year by an uh, angry settler when he was uh, collecting raspberries with his son. Yeah, what a way to go, huh? They did put a memorial there, kind of. There we are. Her, here were hang 38 Sioux Indians on December 26, 1862. So it looks like it's in the middle of a used car lot or something. Yeah, yeah that, that's really sensitive. Don't worry about that. In 1997, they made a, a new monument there called Reconciliation Park. And here they are with, uh, looks like a scroll with the 39 names of the people who were hung. A lot of people said it was uh, inspired by the Vietnam Memorial. Kind of has that look to it, doesn't it? So 1997 Reconciliation Park. There's also a, a buffalo off to the side over there. You can't really see. But this is a lot better than what they used to have. And looks like they shut down the strip mall or used car lot or wherever used to be there. Uh, really, man, really. A war that should have never been fought, which is pretty much most of them. But this one was really kind of way out there. <laughs> so as you think about that, you can go visit the park, sit on that bench, and read Heaven Steel. You find it on Lulu.com and all the other places, of course. But they support indie authors like your friend Mr. H. When you're reading this book, you can look smart, maybe. I don't know. I don't know you that well, but I think you're a smart guy. You're listening to this. You can get adrenaline rushes from the Battle of Lantra and Dunrovin there in the book. And best of all, Mr. H gets a buck, which used to be able to buy a donut, but now that's $1.75. So buy two copies, one for yourself and one give it to somebody. So I was looking around with some dinosaurs like I usually am, and I found Cosmoceratops. I didn't even think this was real. Now, wait till you see the actual picture of this. Anyway, it's a, you know, it's a, about the size of a buffalo, since I was thinking about buffalo and the Sioux War that we were just talking about. And I saw a picture of this, and this has got to be made up. Yeah, look at the horns on top, that frill. Now, yeah, what, what surface, well, what purpose does that serve? I mean, nature is not into ornamentation, usually. Everything nature does has a purpose. I mean, these two horns, yeah, definitely stab somebody. There's blunt horn in the front. This is conjecture. Not really sure, I think because they found it broken off. I don't know why the horns would point outward, unless you're swinging your head to slash at somebody. These things pointing down makes sense to point up, don't you think? You know, that way a uh, you know, predator can't reach up and around or have to really go away. Maybe if it's swinging its head, it's like a buzzsaw if it hits somebody. Smash your face into something, swing back and forth. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's my theory. Mother Nature didn't ask me about it, but... There are a Cosmoceratops, which was in Western North America 83 million years ago. So I thought it was made up, but here's the real skull. There it is. Yep, this crazy frill does actually exist. And the horns, this was broken off, but you see they're angling outward. And yep, instead of a sharp horn, it's just kind of a, kind of a big bump right there. So yep, apparently this thing is real. And you can extrapolate the size by the you know, size of the skull. Here's some other views of it. A guy made a realistic one in a park. This, by the way, is in Alberta, Canada. Uh, it's got the broken horn. I guess he went all out with this thing. But here's the frill. This is what a front view is supposed to look like. A predator coming at it head on. Um, I don't know about the colors. Everybody guesses. So I'm not sure it's with the whiskers. What is this thing, a cat? You know? <laughs> but maybe it did have some of those uh, whiskers when it's you know feeding around digging up stuff i'm not really sure but that's the great thing about paleontology everything's up for debate lived in western north america right here what we would call uh lamaridia yeah so a lamaridian citizen we found none of them over this side so i guess it never made it across the water you know what else is going to live here right yeah down the road triceratops so clearly it's an ancestor even yeah, even occupying the same area now look at this Terra uh, Terrafonus versus Cosmoceratops here. So is this a preview of coming attraction? Does this thing look kind of familiar? Yeah, it looks like T-Rex and Triceratops, but they're kind of smaller. 
You know, so it proves both of these guys are ancestors of the, uh, the big guys that are coming down the road, like I said, 83 million years ago. And a lot of people are going to wonder here about Terra Fafonis here because, uh, one, I didn't know it existed until you know, I did research for this show. And it uh, sounds like, I don't know, some Greek bakery or something here. Terra Fafonis. Yeah. Must have some really good donuts, we hope. So kind of a smaller version of T-Rex, clearly an ancestor. I guess he's showing up next week. And here's our friend Cosmoceratops over here. Now, battles between Terra Fafonis and Cosmoceratops, how would they turn out? Eh, probably about 70% going for the carnivore here. That's I did a little research on um, on uh, T-Rex versus Triceratops, so I figure it probably ended up about the same way. But can't be an easy win, man, getting past that frill. And like I said, I don't know if he's slashing with these twisted horns or not because it's bad enough getting hit head on. But if you're swinging and get hit by one of these things, man, it can do some serious damage. Now, speaking of serious damage, let's talk about the Steelers' uh, defense. They did some damage to Atlanta. Offense, yeah, you're just kind of there. But we did get the win, 18-10. to 10. Can't uh, complain too much about that. And here's our MVP, right? Watts just hitting Kirk Cousins all day long. There's the ball. Uh, I, I'm enjoying hitting the quarterback, but remember where the ball goes. So those are MVPs for this game. T.J. Watt and over here was... Bo uh, Chris Boswell, and uh, he hit six field goals. This The record, NFL record and Steeler record is seven back in 1967. Last time the Steelers had to kick six field goals to win a game was in 2016 playoffs against Kansas City, 18-16. to 16, I think it's their last playoff victory. Uh, I think so, yeah. Um, so we'll see what happens. They got to feel these two guys are going to be showing up for the game in Denver. Our quarterback was supposed to be Russell uh, Wilson, but, you know, he hurt his calf, so Justin Fields came in. Um, not the greatest day, but we got the win, right? 18 to 10. Long as you win, that's what matters, but it's a lot easier when you're scoring touchdowns, not kicking field goals all day. So it looked like the Steeler game plan was uh, get the ball, take a knee, and have Boswell take a shot at it. 57-yard field goal, two others and 50 yards out. So, you know, if it comes down to a field goal battle, I feel pretty good about it. So we got the Broncos coming up, Steelers versus Broncos, a place that kickers have actually done very well despite the altitude and wind on occasion. But Steelers head over to Denver for game two. I was hoping Russell Wilson get the start against his former team, but it looks like we're running with Justin Fields again. And look at this. The Broncos are going to wear white at home. You know I hate that. They know I hate it when people wear white at home, right? It's too much of a Dallas Cowboy, Cleveland Browns thing. But they're going to do it. That's okay. We'll still beat you. But you know I don't like that. You know they're trying to get on my nerves. Who's going to be our MVP for this game? I don't know. It might be Chris Boswell again. A win's a win. Be nice if we score a bunch of touchdowns. But like I said, as long as you get the win, that's all that matters. And Denver is a great place to kick. Even though you got bad weather and a lot of wind on occasion. But hey, it's early September, man. Should be okay. Starting quarterback for Denver is Bo Nix. They put him out. He's a rookie. It's his first year. They put him out there against Seattle. Uh, of course, they didn't win, but, you know, that's what you get with a rookie quarterback. He has to take his lumps. So he took his lumps in the first game, and hopefully he'll take a lot more lumps in the second game, courtesy of T.J. Watts again. So you get ready to see T.J. Watts again. You're going to see this guy coming down off the right side. So Bo Nix might need to roll to the left. I'm not giving anything away because any competent coaching staff would have figured that out on their own. I just know this guy's name here is Pitts, even though he plays for Atlanta. <laughs> so how was the Steelers offense got to do? Well, here's the good news. You can just kind of start over. Didn't really do anything the first time, but you got to win. So do the usual, uh, you know, run the ball and throw it really well. Probably short passes. Denver tends to have pretty good secondary. So some short passes, some runs, keep that defense off the field. So when the defense does come on, we see a lot more of this. You guys have yourself a fantastic day. Don't you forget to like and subscribe. Check out my history lectures I've been posting, the old ones for my classes. I put them up every couple of days. Uh, people seem to like China and India for some reason. And, uh, hey, why don't you check out Heaven Still when you have a chance. Lulu.com. Have a great day, and I will see you next time. Das Vidanya.